three, two, one should just be for you. Okay, full screen. Okay, I actually want to record that. That's good. And, uh, okay. Um, all right, today, um, as you probably already see the email, I'm going to give a guest lecture about distributed pervasive systems. Um, today's uh, lecture is going to be in two parts. The first part, I'm going to first talk about what the um, pervasive computing is and has a related to distributed systems. And also going to give some example of the popular application domains that are uh, uh, in use today uh, that use pervasive uh, uh, systems. And also talk a little bit about the sensor networks, uh, and how each sensor is as a resource constraint devices. And the second part, we want to uh, switch the gear a little bit and talking about the green computing in a sense that uh, we're going to see how we can actually use the uh, distributed, uh, the sensor networks, uh, versus, uh, like the sensor, to actually uh, you know, uh, push the computing to be on the green side. I'm going to give two uh, case study examples. One is for the data centers, and the other is for the uh, uh, smart buildings. Okay? So, okay, so uh, first of all, what is per pervasive computing? So, literally, uh, pervasive computing just means that will see uh, computing devices every well nowadays. And those, uh, uh, you see the increasing number of the devices uh, that, uh, that are used for the purpose of uh, either it's going to be a smart city, smart homes, or anything else that is you, you want to achieve a task, a certain functionality. We're going to look at how the smart home is actually done, but just give you a quick example of how the smart city works. So basically, if you, you go to Boston or you, do, you take any subway, you will see uh, this uh, display uh, bullet saying, uh, when is your next train comes in, right? So, so basically, it is an example of how, uh, how people, the city infrastructure, use the, uh, dis the, the sensors to actually uh, display the information in terms of to uh, facilitate or improve the citizen's life. Basically telling you, you know, the the train. What is the next train is going to be? What this information can also be pushed into your mobile devices, as example. Okay, so as I said, you know, the pervasive computing is they all have a purpose, um, and the relation between the pervasive computing and distributed system is that if you take in individual computing devices and you put them together, and you have this interconnected uh, networks. And despite that, the sensor itself is, is a little different than our normal, uh, whatever we talked about in a previous lecture about uh, the, uh, the servers. Um, we can think of that they also have these fundamental challenges we were facing in terms of uh, distributed systems. For example, uh, time uh, synchronization is still the problem when you have uh, billions of sensors deployed. Um, we're going to talk about it when we talk about duty cycles uh, in the coming slides. Basically, the idea is that most of the fundamental problems of distributed uh, systems that you got started uh, previous uh, still apply. But uh, for, uh, for the pervasive computing in terms of the, the device itself, it's going to be a big constraint uh, for the resource, uh, resource constraint uh, in terms of CPU and uh, RAM and battery which imposes uh, actual challenges in how to design a more efficient uh, distributed systems. Okay, so, so basically, um, when we talk about uh, uh, dis distributed uh, pervasive computing, maybe perhaps you more heard about the Internet of Things. Um, this is a more popular term for um, this pervasive computing uh, nowadays. You see that uh, probably in the news heard it over radio and the thing is that the more technical term for this is just pervasive computer system networks, right? So, um, two things that I want to mention about the pervasive computing in the sense of the Internet of Things is that the first thing is that why such things, such trends becomes popular uh, is driven by the need that, as I mentioned, that the functionality that people are striving for, that they want to build a interconnected uh, functional um, like smart city or smart home, that's the fir first aspect, it's a need. The second thing is that it's actually the hardware itself, the advancement in hardware itself. So previously, if you think about, so any chips that um, you will be 
um, able to purchase. It's not going to be in this size. So this is basically a uh, micro single board microcontroller like board. Um, you will have everything here, um, just like a tiny computers, but except it's just less you know uh, powerful. So as the compu computing devices are getting smaller, like in this many sizes, um, they actually are much easier to um, encapsulate it and deploy it. And also the, the, the prices are actually getting uh, lower in that sense. So it makes it you know, for wide deployment. Okay, so for, so basically one, the, the thing that you need to remember for the, um, whatever we call this, um, sensor networks or IoT, IOTs, is that they all have the loop of sensing and you will have, uh, so, so basically sensing means that you will have the sensor that you will collect data uh, from the environment or if, if, if you have the wearable devices, you could be collecting the you know, person data from yourself, right? And then they're going to connect to each other and do collect data and then they're going to do analysis about data. And finally, it's going to be either the chip itself has some simple functionality to figure out, based on certain conditions, what is task they want to do. So if, uh, if you want to check out there, it's a pretty cool thing. If less than that, than that. So basically, you know, it allows you to define some simple functionality. You can actually do cool things, you know, using those simple board chips, right? So so basically, control either could be on board or it could upload it to some other uh, server, like cloud servers, and then it finally comes back in terms of, you know, how do you actually changing uh, whatever data you want to sense in that way. Okay, so this is just the, the loop. So let's just take a look at a um, couple of two examples of how this um, uh, this sensor network is deployed in the, our daily lives. So the first example I want to give is the smart home example. Okay, so, so basically here it shows uh, for Pretty popular um, a gadget you can buy for your home to make it uh, as a you know, smart automatic home. The first thing you see is a uh, uh, Philip Hue here. So, uh, as most of you probably already know, Philip Hue is a uh, smart light bulb. What it does is that you can buy one of the kit, and uh, what you do is that open the box, you will have a light bulb itself that just like, you know, it looks like normal light bulb. But instead, after you plug in into whatever lamp, um, it also comes with a, a Philip hub itself. So basically, you can think about this as a, a device that communicates to your light bulb here. So they have some closed um, pro proprietary uh, protocols that communicate between the light bulb and the hub. And the hub will talk to your Wi Fi. And you will see why we have this setup. Um, later on when we talk about um, uh, more in detail about the sensor. So you have the router here. And uh, so basically you use your smart devices or whatever, the web browser to control the light bulb. So in this, in this particular uh, example, the light bulb will be the, the sensor node who we're talking about. Um, which is, doesn't really sense anything, it just say control unit that we can use our smartphone to control. Okay, so this is what uh, what you normally will uh, get and set it up. And of course there are other type of uh, things like the, the right, right hand side is the Nest thermostat, and you will have this smart switch, basically you just buy one of those and plug it into the normal outlet and you plug your um, devices in that, in that, and you can actually see uh, in terms of the uh, power consumptions or real time power consumption in your devices. In all, um, whatever is here uh, all share similar architecture as I draw here. It just needs to replace whatever the uh, device is here. So, one thing I want to mention is that uh, most of this manufacturer actually uh, they want to keep the customer. Uh, inside. So what they do is that, as I mentioned, they will have this proprietary uh, uh, protocols that help them to do um, collab 
collaborative, um, you know, smart devices, right? So what that means is that if you pick anything you buy from Philips, and probably we're not going to work uh, seamlessly with any devices you buy, let's say from Google. But Google has this product uh, line that you not only have those thermostats, right? So, so basically, it has the thermostat, um, and also it will have cameras and small detectors and everything. So after you purchase all the things, what they do is that they will be able to uh, allow you to, for example, if you go on a travel, you'll be able to configure one of um, the, you know, your camera says, you know, detect the motion if somebody entered. And once you figure, once you configure that, and it will automatically, uh, you know, update your uh, temperature setting in the thermostat saying, you know, you actually figure out you're not going to be home and you want to, they're going to do more um, energy saving in terms of the uh, thermostats. Okay, so just, this is just an example of the, the home. And also, of course, we have this uh, personal health monitors. So by the way, um, the thing about most of the home automation d devices is that they actually are plugged in, so they are powered. Okay, so the differences here is about this, this particular domain about the personal health devices is mostly they are powered by battery. And in essence, it makes a huge difference in terms of the well wearable limitation because I will probably don't want to wear a, let's say, 10 kilograms of watch on my wrist. That give a limitation of uh, how much, uh, you know, battery power they can put in. In a sense that um, most wearable devices, uh, they have very uh, uh, limited uh, power uh, devices. Usually, it comes in a range of uh, 200 to 300 milliamp hour. What it means is that you know, for Apple, you claim that you can use it for 18 hours without charge. But it also depends on what you use. And we're going to look at it, you know, for a particular computation sensing and transfer, uh, transferring data and how much uh, uh, power we actually use. So basically, they, the, in this particular example, remember I told you this is a, the architect for a uh, home automation system. But if you take the personal uh, house monitor devices, uh, it, things change a little bit. So we take a particular device, let's say a bit tracker, and what it does is that you will use, most of the time you will use your mobile device as a process to actually upload data. So your Fitbit is going to use uh, something called the Bluetooth. Bluetooth LE, which is low energy Bluetooth. So underneath is, is the same as Bluetooth, but what I do is that they they decrease the uh, frequency hopping and the regular Bluetooth protocol in a sense that to save energy. But the details about this, you don't, real, it's not really uh, part of this course, but uh, basically the idea is that you use the Fitbit con uh, connects to your mobile devices and everything else just work like this. So instead of having a uh, specific hardware hub and you were useful in mobile devices here. Okay, so this is a two different um, architecture for the current smart applications. So again, this is this is basically just summarized of uh, what I talked about in terms of uh, the two uh, different architectures. Um, the, the basic idea is whether you were use something that uh, uh, that's already have, which is your smart phone, or you would need to buy some, uh, you know, something like uh, hardware, like the Philip Park, to actually uh, connect all your devices. Okay? Any questions so far? Okay, so. After we talk about the applications, we will look now we're going to look, take individual things, what the sensor we're going to look, you know, what the characteristics of those sensors. So as I said, um, you can think of them as uh, individual s servers, but they're just mini computers in a sense that they are very resource constrained. Um, so if you record or, you know, from any other lecture you 
you learned uh, most of devices when they are communicating with each other. Mostly, you know, they communicate use TCP IP. Or it could be something else. But overall, the idea is that they use a standard ISO internet you know, protocol stacks, right? But when we talk about when this in embedded system, the sensor networks that's trying to communicate with each other, um, Wi-Fi is not the best pro protocol to choose. Remember I said those devices are very battery and power constrained. And Wi-Fi, it turned out to be the protocol that actually consume a lot of energies. So it is not the best option. And we will look in the next slides and what the standard uh, wireless, wireless protocol that is actually used. Okay, so, so basically, we will see some examples of uh, individual uh, sensors and uh, uh, everything else comes on. Basically, um, you know, we will see each of the CPU and storage, RAM, and radio in the next slides. Okay, so just first, um, the tool for communication, as I said, is not going to be using Wi-Fi anymore. Um, what it used is that um, they have some uh, protocols that are designed specifically for the embedded system just for the power, uh, just for saving the power, the power consumption aspect. So basically, um, mo mostly they use three bands here, which is, uh, this is a, a non-commercial band that is reserved for the uh, ISN stands for industry science, science scientific and uh, medicine. So this is a non-commercial band. Okay, so, so that is not some it, it is not the telecommunication then. Anyway, so, so basically, uh, the last one is 2.4 gigahertz. You probably already heard of it because Wi-Fi is also, uh, besides the 5G one, they're also using 2.4 gigahertz. Okay, so, so basically, um, that comes with the first choice. Okay, when you design a protocol, you can choose between its three common bands you can choose for 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 thirties uh, megahertz or you can choose two point four gigahertz right so which comes to the first thing about frequency okay so the second thing is that um, um, once you have the frequency you you know so so basically the trade off is that the higher the frequency um, you're going to have um, better with in the uh, in theory, okay. So that's that's why you know we have Wi-Fi on 2.4 gigahertz, not 4 430 megahertz. Okay. So so this is the, the first trade-off is that if you have higher frequency, you are turned to have higher bandwidth in theory. But you know whatever the actual bandwidth you are achieving depends on how your protocol is designed. Okay. So. Then you, the, the question you will be asking is that then why do we don't just choose 2.4 gigahertz or anything else? Why don't they just give us like 5 gigahertz? Why don't everyone just use 5 gigahertz, right? Well, it turns out that the second trade-off that you'll get is that um, the higher the frequency you're running at, the more power consumption that you're going to run to. So, which is ne not necessarily the, the, the the best scenario you want to get into for the um, sensor, which is battery power, right? For Wi-Fi devices, it's not much a big deal because I don't really care about my, you know, laptop actually using Wi-Fi as long as it has very good bandwidth, right? Because you know, power is not one of my major concern. I'm more mostly concerned about the performance, right? So that's why um, this is the first reason why not. Not everything is in the single band. Okay, the second thing is that, of course, if everything is trying to use the same frequency, it's going to have interferences. So basically, um, you'll, you'll turn to have more loosey links and the packets return as long as this. So, so which, which is basically why um, some of them, like for example, Z Wave, uh, which is the, the de facto. Uh, not that factor, but most popular uh, home automation protocol. They actually, uh, they are not running on the popular 2.4 gigahertz uh, band. They are running on a 
in the US is 900 megahertz. So, so they choose the band that is less crowded. Um, so they can actually uh, have better, uh, better uh, reliable link. So basically, this is uh, the two trade-off. The third one is actually the range. Okay. So take an example here. So we all, um, so basically the boot Bluetooth and um, Bluetooth and the Zigbee are all operates on the 2.4 uh, uh, giga, gigahertz. Okay, so so the, the idea is that the trade-off is if you have higher bandwidth, which means the Zigbee has to, uh, sorry, the Bluetooth has a higher uh, bandwidth than the Zigbee. The potentially that the indicates that the Bluetooth has a shorter range than Zigbee. Okay, so why is that? Just imagine that you know one way to remember is this is that if we the frequency is just how powerful I talk. So if I maintain a level of my volume, if I talk really fast, very fast, you will have a harder time to get what I'm saying, which is however how fast I talk is the bandwidth, right? Versus if I talk really slow, then you would turn to even hear me if you are further away. So this is basically the trade-off between the range and the bandwidth. So, so basically, my point is, when designing the protocols, you have sort of taken all those things into the consideration. Um, and based on different applications, whether you actually need you know, a 100 meter in range, or you only need a device to talk within 10 minutes, one minute. And it gives you the flexibility in terms of which protocol you use or design your own protocol. Okay, so, right, so the other thing is, in terms of the power consumption, um, I listed one of the uh, pretty popular uh, RF, which is radio frequency tr uh, transceivers, uh, uh, how much power it actually costs to transmit and receive the, the packets, the messages. Um, so basically, um, as you see, you know, it's around 20 mil million. So as I said, um, most of the devices will have 200 to 300 uh, million per uh, an hour, which basically come into this. If they are continuous transferring the data, it's going to, they can only run for 10 hours or 15 hours, uh, which is, is, a, is a concern. You don't want to necessarily go change the battery for your sensor every 10 hours, right? So it's going to incur more human work than actually the benefits of having the sensor there. So. One thing to notice is that, um, as you probably will uh, remember after we t when we talk about CPU, is that the power consumption in the radio is actually the, the most uh, uh, power consumption that is used in the sensor uh, compared to other components. So reducing the, the power consumption in radio is actually much more uh, demanding and important in terms of designing the chips. Okay, so the other thing is that listening actually take more power because by default, uh, most of the transceivers actually use amplifier when they are listening. Basically, um, what it means is that even though if I speak very low and if you wear some kind of, I don't know, uh, amplifier and you will be able to pick up my volume even if I speak low. And by default, it is on the receiver side, not the transmitter side. So that's why the listening actually uh, costs more energies. Okay? So, so we have the radio, which is how we actually interconnect uh, each individual uh, sensors. And for each particular uh, chips, and we will have the CPU inside. So one point that I just want to mention is that they are very, very small CPUs. Okay, as you can see, this is where the microcontroller is. They will have, so normally they, they, they will have the, uh, the, the onboard uh, flash. Basically this is where you put your code in. So it, as you see, there's no, nothing else besides this board <coughs> here that can actually store your data, do the computation. So CPU is right, right here. There's no external uh, uh, flash uh, storage as we will cover in the next slides. So basically, you have to put everything in this tiny, uh, tiny uh, 
a block. This is, this is not even the you know the size of whatever the excuse me the network card in the number Mac. So the so actually the the receiver the network uh, card is like in terms of the, the the antenna is like longer in this range. So this is not even a network card size. So you have to do a lot of things in this. So one thing you need to know is that what it what it, the limitation gives you is that first that it will have a uh, you know, it's instead of a 32-bit or a 64-bit, you usually will program in and you know use encounters in the normal servers, and then you have to be um, doing um, a bit uh, address translations and all this jazz adjust, and you have to you know mm, sometimes it doesn't even have a operating system running on that, or most time you can use um, some very lightweight uh, operating system because you know the last thing you want is that the operating system take all their energy solve and then you left with no energy so no processing power to do anything else. So if you're interested, uh, there are three different type of uh, uh, operating system that runs on this type of uh, microcontroller. Uh, one is called a tiny OS. So this is something developed by Berkeley and still a lot of people who are doing sensor networks are still using this type of uh, operating system. So basically this type of operating system can work in microcontrollable uh, unit. And the other popular one is called Contiki. So so this and Ryle, so basically this one has become more popular because it gives you, um, so for this you have to write in uh, your own uh, languages or there are some, uh, you can use some library to write in C or C++, but this actually gives you a higher level uh, interfaces you can write. Yeah, so, so which has become uh, a little popular in recent years. Okay, so so as I said, you know, they will have the internal uh, flash memory for code inside this uh, um, MCU. Okay, so okay, so the other thing I want to mention in the slides is that we have these two examples here. Um, as you see, um, they are not x86, which is whatever the architecture we are mostly familiar with. They are. So here it is, one is ABR, one is NSP, and it's P, uh, four suites, suites 30, and then one is ARM. So the common thing about all this thing, all this architecture is their they belongs to the risk family. So um, you know, if you take architecture, you probably know that this is a reduced infrastructure set. So basically, which, which means that it allows uh, the controller to build with less tran uh, trans transistor. Uh, so, so basically, it allows you to, um, so basically, transferring to this chip, it just allows you to go a smaller on the size. Okay, transistors. Yes. So, so versus you know the as uh, x eighty six is uh, a six, right? So, okay, so. Um, so next, we, we talk about you know how they communicate when we talk about the CPU, and now we come to the, the flash story side. So, so first, let's take a look at uh, what type of uh, uh, flash devices the the raw flash we have here. So we have the serial non-flash and the non-flash. So nowadays, non-flash is actually uh, more popular. Um, you know, I don't know why. Uh, it's probably you know, most likely my guess is going to be uh, the performance is much better. But although the, the high level message is that uh, most people are using, if you encounter anything like SD card, it's probably not flash. Okay. So for the flash, we have the, um, so basically there are a couple things we need to understand the flash in order uh, to design a efficient uh, uh, chip, a efficient uh, you know, embedded sensor. The first thing is that given if you given a uh, unformatted or this, let's say raw flash, what it comes is that it has little pages that you can store information in. Like okay, so this is the quantum side. Okay, so as as you probably remember from the you know uh, open system courses that if you have something like this, the first thing you need 
is some kind of address, either physical or logical address, enabled to actually fetch the content from the underlying devices. What operating system does is give you an interface to the underlying uh, the disk, depending on the file system, allows you to get the get the content right. So for the flash, it's a little different. Okay, so it still needs some kind of uh, uh, layer to actually assess this content. Okay, what, what the layer called is called um, flash translation layer. So basically what it does is it will take whatever operating system will say, uh, let's get you know the, uh, the content in um, one on one page and you'll get it uh, and the FL, FTL will take this address and transfer it into the physical address and uh, uh, this is a raw flash and uh, we'll fetch the content, uh, return the content, content to all this. Okay, so there are a couple of things. Um, so what, well, so designing uh, the algorithm, the F F FTL, L, FTL for the flash is, is a little bit more complicated in the normal mechanical drive. Uh, they are con the reasons being the following. The first you have to understand is that um, the flash is brought into block. So above the, the, the actually physical pages system contents, they will have you know, block. So basically in this example, you know, my block has three pages, which is not realistic, of course, but just for example, it has three, three pages in the particular block. block. And and okay, so there are three type of uh, operations you would did, you would do. Uh, one is read. Okay, so so read is most is, is the most straightforward one. So read can read in the page level. Basically, means that whatever you read, you get the content from the here. <coughs> okay. The other one is program. Oh, okay, so what it means it is it is write. Okay, so you can you can think about. It. As right. So write is also happening in the page level. So basically, if I say, I take the content from the address 101 and I say, okay, I want to increment it or I want to change it to something else. And from the open systems perspective, I will write a new value into this address. However, the underlying structure of flash doesn't allow you to do overwrite. What it means is that whatever you make changes to this physical, Logical address is not going to affect it. It's not going to be uh, show up in this uh, physical address here. Instead, what it's going to what it's going to do is it's going to do something called lock structure write. What it means is it's going to find the next available uh, pages of rock that you can actually write to, and remember the mapping between the physical. Sorry, the logical and the physical thing. Physical or just mapping and in the in this transfer translation layer, and you will say and you return to the OR said I already write which whatever you write. So this is not the end of the story because what it means, the the actual limitation comes in when you need to erase whatever, so basically it means delete, right? So you, if you, whatever you want to delete the page, it doesn't happen in page level, instead it happens in block level. Okay, so think about this. If I want to delete a page, I'm not only deleting the page itself, I'm, only, I'm also deleting everything that in the same block as the, 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 as the page I'm deleting which is a huge problem here, because now I need to consider the fact that I have to move, if these two are actually written, I need to move these two um, data blocks somewhere else by using the log structure, right, to find the next available uh, place to actually write to it. And, and also, it's not becoming void immediately, which means I will have to deal with garbage correction, which is going to be the performance killer here. Okay, so, so basically the idea is that if you understand uh, 
the basic limitation is that the erase has to happen in a block. And it comes with the trade-off that we want good performance, then that means that we use lock structure to write, to do a pen writing. And then we also want to be able to spread out the write so that uh, each individual pages are, you know, the physical contents actually being write evenly so we don't have a particular a block that actually being constantly read and write. Read is probably okay, but write is bad. So we don't want it to constantly write to a particular block so that that sector is just broke. Okay, and everything else still works. So you will end up with a broken SSD. So this is how the, um, uh, the underlying uh, row flash actually works. So whatever you see the SSD is actually already have this uh, FTL layer that and so it's right here, so it's like an SSD, right? So you can, you can basically, um, uh, the, op you know, the operating system can actually treat it as any uh, disk, any disk level uh, storage and actually can write, write and read it to, to it using any standard you know, uh, interfaces. Okay, so, all right, so, The last uh, but most important part about the chip, uh, the, the board, is about the battery. Okay, so so what make it important is that, as I said, battery does, they are, first they, pop, they are powered mostly by battery, and battery has a limited lifetime, which make the, you know, how to efficiently use this limited uh, power an important problem. So there are multiple ways you, you can actually uh, do it. Sorry. Um, so basically, as I said, you can put on big battery. You can switch from a triple A to double A. You essentially uh, increase it, you know, thousands of milliamp power. And but you have a limit. You have a certain bound in terms of how big the battery you can put into the devices, right? So that gives you a hard limit on that. And then uh, the second most used uh, techniques is called uh, duty cycle. What it means is that you have this device and you only let them power on, only consume uh, the power when they actually have something useful to do. For example, when it actually needs to receive data or send the data or when they actually uh, uh, detect emotion in the, you know, in essence, if it's motion sensors. Okay, so in, in that way, um, the battery is, is conserved because most of the time, when the, the node is asleep, we are not consuming any batteries. Which brings to the, the problem I mentioned in terms of time synchronization, right? So, so basically the idea is that if you have thousands of uh, sensors, they are all use this duty cycle. And it, ha it will, as might well just happen that some of them might wake up at a different time than the other. What if my upstream nodes actually are asleep when I'm about to send a message to them? which they are not there, right? So, uh, which is, first of all, waste my energies, and also I might need to retransmit and further waste it. So the idea is that you want to be able to either have a sleep mode that, you know, to put the nodes in the uh, low power listen mode so that whenever you receive something, uh, sending from your neighbor nodes, you can actually get it and, um, you know, transmit turn itself on and do some uh, useful computations or you know, further send the message to someone else. Um, or you, you need to use some sort of uh, time synchronization to be able to say everyone wake up in every 10 seconds, right? Then, then it comes with whatever the synchronization you talked about earlier. Okay, so this is just example. Okay, so, so basically the idea here, okay, so by the way, the, the mode is Return for the sensor node, so it's it's just something that people commonly refer to. Um, okay, so the third thing is um, that our bee harvesting techniques. So the the most uh, common things you, you heard of is probably uh, you have solar solar powered you know uh, sensors that they can actually transfer the solar power and power itself by solar. But one thing that's really cool 
it's not about uh, use, using all the solar and wind, uh, but more in the in the uh, using any uh, physical vibrations and heat and do some kind of uh, that excuse me and transfer them into the uh, energies. So basically, what I have here is a thermal energy harvesting chip. So basically, what it what it does is that you can actually buy this um, online, and uh, what it does is that it has, uh, both sides has the ceramic uh, surface and they are very cold. So you connect it to one of the board here. Um, basically, you only heat up one side. Okay, doesn't matter how you heat up, you can uh, press it into a hot surface, you can use your finger, and when you do this, and you can actually generate around 20 milli, mil, Mill, milliamps of uh, uh, the, the power. So what it does is, as you probably recall, if we have 20 milliamps, we can actually send a message or packet, right? Because the, the sending is only cost 20 milliamps, as we talk about in the lower radio, in the lower radio um, uh, slides, right? So when you do this for a, a few seconds, it's going to generate enough uh, energy to allow you to send one packet. Okay, which is not a big deal, but think about it, it's just like free energy, right? Probably something that's worth having when you go like surviving pass or something. So, I don't know, yeah. Anyway, so this is pretty cool, but however, you cannot just look at the, the current uh, without looking in, uh, into the voltage, right? Um, it's, it's actually not very, uh, this point in the sense that it, it has enough uh, energies to transfer the message, to transfer the packet, the network packet. But the, the problem is that it only, you know, have around 30 millivolt, which is, if you think about it, the AA batteries of, of around 1.5 volt. So this is just basically nascent. It's, it's very, that's why it takes a few seconds to actually be able to do anything. But still, it's, it's very cool cool things um, and a lot of people are actually doing research in, in this areas to be able to harvest this uh, free energies you know the other thing is we um, some people in our lab is doing this uh, in our physical lab is doing that is actually harvesting the energies from the wildest uh, uh, signals that we have all this Wi-Fi okay which is the other um, area okay so again um, of course, if you talk about, we have sensor nodes, and we talk about, we talk about everything that resembles a mini computer. The one thing that we left out is what a sensor would look like, right? So, so basically, this small thing here is it is a um, a thermometer sensor. So, basically, it will what you do is that normally you can just uh, plug in into one of the board and um, you can read read the uh, data uh, from this uh, the IO here uh, so basically has the, the number in here you can basically go to the, their IDE and read the data so basically what it does this what the assignment sensor does if I you know, rotate it or move it around it will actually generate data and you give the data to to this board and I can uh, potentially do something with the data, right? So this is how you actually assemble them together. Okay, so. Okay, so this is how the, we, so far we talk about how each individual sensor looks like, you know, CPU, small CPU, battery powered. And the, we don't, most of, most of the chips here, we, we don't even have the external SSD, um, but, Nevertheless, um, they are all um, functional sensors you can use to deploy here. So basically, this is a basic give you a high level pictures of how they actually uh, uh, deploy and connect to each other and send message. Um, uh, to, so basically, as I said, the range depends on uh, the protocol you use, you will have a certain range. So if you actually need to cover, say, a thousand meters of uh, the physical area, um, by no means, I don't think any wireless protocol that used in this low power radio can actually do it. So what it usually does 
is you allowed you to do the hops. So basically, for each hop, you will have a certain limitation. Let's say for the Z wave, you have certain makers of the, the range, but you can actually do like you know multiple hops in order to reach a close by gateway, which is basically whatever the data is being aggregated. And from there, it's going to go through your, the normal uh, IP networks and to send it to you know you can send it to to your uh, computers at home routers and you can actually also send it to the internet to do cloud level you know, uh, data processing. Okay. So um, we talk about most of stuff here. Um, uh, so one thing that I want to mention is is that there is a trend that um, actually are saying that uh, once the devices are being deployed uh, widely and we'll have a lot of data. So uh, people are advocating the, the transition that we're going to have all this uh, data sent into the internet so that even though individual sensors will only generate like let's say you know, kilobytes of data or megabytes of data, but aggregately we will have this platform of servers that have to uh, process a large stream of data that comes in real time. So which is an active research area that is called data streaming processing and to be able to do real-time uh, event detection, for example, to detect whether some underground water um, pipe is actually broken based on the uh, bio sensor they are being deployed, stuff like that, okay? Any questions so far? Okay, um, all right, so, so just for the rest of time, just want to move on about talking about um, green computing. So the idea is that we can actually use some of the, you know, the sensor network or platforms we talked about to actually to either um, make the IT uh, green, which is the in a data center cases, which data centers is the ITs, or we can actually use some sort of uh, data driven analysis to allow us to, to make, um, for example, the home or office green. And we're gonna talk about some more in this case. Okay, so, as I said, um, so basically the, the first area about making the server crank uh, is a long-standing research area, but mostly the reason it comes back is because we have uh, more data centers that are being built, and reducing the power consumption of one particular server at home probably is not uh, as important, but the thing is that when you have thousands of, uh, thousands of uh, data centers, oh, sorry, Thousands of servers are running inside a gigantic data center. The saving can be essentially really very huge. So this has become the very uh, active research areas about how do you actually uh, use incorporating, incorporating, you know, renewable energies and always on-site storage, which is a battery or any other sort, and to actually improve um, the the energy efficiency of a data center. Just briefly, uh, what a data center is. is a large number of servers that are interconnected in a high level. And here is a picture that shows how big the data center is, if you're familiar with the football field. Okay, so, so um, comes back to why it is an important um, subject, and maybe just give you a um, intuitive example of how much it actually costs, and you will probably think it's gonna be an important problem, at least money-wise, right? So let's take a typical Google, Google data center as an example. Okay, so nowadays the data center is actually going to, so this is only one data center, but nowadays the, even the one data center will have more than 100K servers. But regardless, let's take 100 server as an example. And uh, uh, if we assume that each server will have consumed 500 watts per server, and by simply calculating the by simply calculating how many hours it's going to be on, uh, here assume that it's always on, meaning 24 hours, seven, seven days, yeah. sorry, 365 days per year, it's going to be always on, and, and but here we says the monthly cost is going to be you know, $50. Okay, $50 is not a big deal, but if you multiply it by you know, 100 case of server, it's going to give you five billions of just the energy costs which is a big deal. Okay, so as I, well, 
in the next lecture, they are probably going to talk about how this is actually going to work. But basically, the two big chunk in terms of the data center energy consumption comes from power to server itself and cool to server itself. So powering is five billion, five million, and the cooling is actually going to be, you know, doubling that or in the most uh, efficient cases, in the Google cases with the PUZ of 1.2, it's going to be six, bill, six million. So one word about PUE is that PUE just basically is a power, power usage uh, efficiency. And I don't know whether you guys have been to the NGHPCC during the field trip or no, haven't. So basically, um, so NGHPCC is a green data center as here. The Google PUE here is also a green data center. That's why it has a very high, so you hit PUE. When I say high, I mean good, which the value is low. Okay, so that comes to how we calculate the, the PUE. The PUE is the total power that consumed by the data center uh, divided by the total, uh, the total power that consumed by the IP, which is the server. So basically, 1.2 means 28% of overhead in terms of cooling. So for NGHPCC, that which is the data center in Holyoke, is actually is is very you know, well state of the art is 1.3, which is pretty good because uh, it's a uh, you know academia data center. So but we are still trying to improve it uh, regardless. Um, but anyway, the point is um, how consumption is a huge deal in terms of the uh, money wise. So. If you can think of like one straightforward way to actually reduce the bill, it's just you can just put half of the data center, you know, the server to sleep, right? So then, then you can just immediately reduce it from five million to 2.5 million. Okay, which seems a little silly, but let's go back to the motivation and underlying reason why it is a viable idea. First of all, uh, data center is usually over provisioned. What it means is that um, if I only need 500, let's say I only need 50, 50K servers, I will usually provision, sorry, if I only need 50K server normally, but the peak is uh, I need 100K servers, I will have 100K servers standby. But the truth is I don't usually always need 100K servers, right? I only need 50K servers. So most of the time you can shut them down without causing any operation uh, disruption, okay? So the second thing is that uh, the one technology uh, especially makes such, uh, uh, you know, shutting server down very easy instead of manually go and turn it off. First of all, well, of course you can use something like the smart switches we talked about earlier. You can just use the smartphone to turn off the, the switches but the other thing is, is about um, uh, virtualization. So what it does is that it allows you to move uh, the servers from uh, underutilized, underutilized, underutilized server and consolidate one into like half of the data center's side and you actually turn, off, turn down the other side, half. Otherwise, you know, what if they all have very low, you know, light utilization, you cannot do anything but still have them all, right? So. So basically, this is the two things that you can do. All right, so, okay, as I said, it is an important problem, and this usually have uh, uh, three approach, approaches. And uh, so basically, we talk about how to reduce the cost of running the servers. And um, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, reducing the cooling, uh, there are um, several approaches that can do still sound silly, but as they are they all very effective approach. The first of all is that um, you can choose the locations that give you the the benefit in terms of the free cooling. What it means is that if you build a data center in a cold climate, uh, here it says in uh, Iceland or even in uh, you know Massachusetts, which we have six months of winter, and we can just free use this free winter. And what you literally need to do is you use the exhaust to uh, put out the hot air inside the data center and you know, put in the uh, cold air from outside and to do this air uh, flow route, right? So 
it give it that that reduce the need for you to actually use something like an AC or a chiller, right? So in essence, this is actually not like some joke, but like this and just like Google or Facebook to actually use you know free air cooling to do something like uh, this. And the other thing is that even even sound more ridiculous is that you don't have this closed um, data center infrastructure. Instead, you have this open infrastructure that um, it doesn't, you know, you actually just contact with the, the outside air uh, immediately, uh, you know, directly, uh, which is what it actually shows here. And so anyway, so this is, a, a, you know, one type of thing for air cooling. A second thing is actually used in what uh, the NGHPCC, the Green Data Center, is that uh, we use eva evapor evaporative cooling. What it means is that we will use the cold water. Um, instead of using the exhaust, we use the cold water to loop inside a data center. So the, when the cold water uh, flows through the data center pipe, and it will actually do the heat exchange and actually, uh, you know, a lot of uh, the, the hot air will come with the, uh, the cold water and actually uh, be in a, a pump into the exhaust on the second floor. And they, over there, they would they would cool down the, the hot water to cold again um, by you know doing exchange with other cold water outside or some other techniques using chillers or whatever. So basically, so other the second approach is, is using the um, water cooling. Okay, so we're gonna skip this. So the next thing we want to talk about is. Uh, how to use the, you know, all the sensors um, that we talked about to actually make the, uh, the whatever the physical infrastructure green. In this example, is going to be uh, uh, the home. So just an intuitive uh, idea is that in a particular, in a specific home, you know, usually the lighting and, and the heating or cooling actually consists of around like 80% of uh, energy bills, right? So the so idea is that if you can target all this big portions you will be able to actually uh, reduce the energy consumptions. And the other thing is that uh, most of people uh, will have uh, pretty static uh, schedules, meaning you will go to work around 8 and come back at 5, something like that, right? So so based on this schedule and the sensor, and you can have the occupancy sensor deployed at home, and you can actually uh, do something about it to actually turn on or off the heat when you're going away and uh, also turn off of the light if you forgot to do something. Okay, so so basically uh, this is the overview of the high level approach. And as I said, um, you can do the measure monitor uh, using the sensors we talked about and you can aggregate the data and you can um, you know either send it to the cloud or you can do it yourself as well and you can figure out what is the you know the pattern and what is the utilization looks like, you know, when do you do the laundry and then et cetera. And based on that, you can come up with some scheduling, dynamic schedule instead of the static one, uh, which is most most of you know dumb devices actually have already have the static uh, schedule uh, embedded. But instead you want to have a dynamic schedule that actually um, changes in according to whatever your uh, behavior changes, right? So this is the three steps. So this is just a breakdown. I'm going to skip this. I'm just going to look at in, inside the uh, smart building and homes and how you go smart buildings. Uh, uh, two type of uh, monitoring you can do. The first type of monitoring is a more fine-grained monitoring that you can use uh, basically a uh, meter monitoring, uh, outlet monitoring. Basically, what you do is just you plug one of those um, to this outlet, and it will give you. And you plug your appliances here, and you can. Uh, and also, this one, this device is key. Can actually communicate to any. To you can configure a server to talk to, it and actually can collect the data, and so that you can analyze uh, the very fine grained um, data that actually uh, are used by your appliance. So you can figure out which which uh, whether your heat or furnace is actually efficient or not, and this is just more like a one-time analysis. So the, the idea is that it has some advantages and disadvantages to it. Uh, the first thing is that it's actually 
Well, if you think about for every uh, outlet, you have to plug one of those, and just think about how many outlets there, and time-wise, it's not going to be manageable or practical. Practical, but um, but the, the again the, the the one benefit, one of the benefits is to give you more fine grain data and control in terms of um, you making decisions. The second thing is that you can do meter level monitoring. Basically, it gives you the the access to one particular panel. You, you can usually find this in your basement or you know, if you live in the house and you have this. And basically, you don't need to go to every room and deploy uh, the meter. Instead, you will meter every uh, switch here and to figure out uh, what each switch is actually used. And you can use, by, by knowing what each switch is connected to which appliance, you will know the, the power profile of each appliance is doing some simple aggregation and the subtractions, right? So this is the second thing. Okay, so I mean, again, so after you get the data, um, you can do real-time analysis. They basically, um, it's going to show you in real time how your uh, uh, energy consumption is at your home, or you can also look some summary in terms of uh, uh, the energy consumptions. But um, there's nothing fancy about it. Um, so the idea is that the, the way you want to analyze the data, so you want to come with it in some insight so that you can actually use it to optimize the energy usages, right? Okay, so, so the third thing that is is that let's just skip that as the same as this. So we use we can use uh, re renewables in terms of uh, improve the energy efficiency. Because the whole point of doing this is we just want the we want to improve the energy efficiency, right? So the other thing is that we can uh, incorporate the renewable. And I don't know whether you see this, but we also still have this. Uh, uh, but not exactly. But that one is more for weather. But we used to have this uh, wind winter wind internal whatever and solar panel on the top, on the third roof in a computer science building to do some experiments and stuff. And um, the idea is that you want to be able to har harvesting this um, energies and use it at home. So one, one particular uh, barrier we're seeing here is that um, those, those energy generated are mostly uh, intermittent. What it means is that when there is no, you know, no, it's not sunny or it's cloudy, it's going, not going to be continuous uh, power generated by the solar. Instead, what you pr probably want is you want to come up with some uh, energy storage to be able to flatten out uh, the generation, the, the power generation, so you can actually either use it later, or what you cannot wait until there's power to use it, but what you can do is you can actually shift the power by using energy battery, right? So this is basically the idea. So one way to do it that is that you can use the, the actual uh, the solar energies to heat up water uh, and use water later, or uh, as use water as a you know, heat resource, heat sources, right? So this is one way to do it. Okay, so the last but not least part is that all this would not happen if we don't have you know the incentive for uh, people, human like us, to actually be actively participated in it. So for example. If I tell you you can only save one dollar when you install all this fancy, you know, uh, you know, smart home automation or whatever power metering stuff in your home, you probably are not going to do it. But you, if you think about in the long run, in the in the bigger picture here, everyone save a little bit of energy is going to be, you know, as a society, we're going to make a much bigger differences. Which is why there are uh, researchers now doing. Uh, in the area that you can actually build a community that all have uh, the solar panels and you can aggregate the solar, uh, solar power that generated from a particular community and you can sell this uh, any, uh, electricity back to the grid to make a uh, profit for the, the community. So everyone will be more incentive to actually install the, the solar panel, right? Um, what is that? Well, basically the idea is that, you know, for us, uh, our our role is to be aware of it and also develop better tools and you know interfaces for normal users to use this type of uh, technologies, right? So for that, um, I would like to summarize. And uh, basically, the three takeaway for today's class is that um, after cl today's class, uh, hopefully you will understand that inter underneath the Internet of Things 
is going to be uh, you know, microcontroller unit like this. And um, they are very resource constrained. And it comes with, they're just like your computer, but many in size. And they, are lim they have limitation in terms of the uh, computation and power. But essentially, you can do is that uh, when designing one of this chip, you want to be able to take the energy into consideration. And together with any other constraint you already started in uh, the previous uh, lecture about the distributed systems. Um, the second thing is that uh, we are not just interested in, in particular sensor and platforms. We're not just starting this for itself. The bigger role of this particular sensor platform is that we'll be able to transform these technologies to actually help in uh, a lot of uh, domains. Uh, two particular domain I mentioned today is this is about uh, the, the make the data center more green and also make uh, you know build a smart home or building uh, energy management uh, tools. Okay, so with that, okay, so we are right at time. So just want to stop here. Okay. And that's it. Thank you.